So we've had a bit of fun with what I would class as quite a brutal iron. It's cheap, you can achieve with it. If you struggle getting straight lines with your irons, it being at a point will help immensely. And you can even go a little further with the dividers or the markers to get the groove a little deeper for your point. But that's not permission to use a stitch groove. A stitch groove will not do you any favours. I don't care what anybody says. A race is a tool to take a groove out of leather, but there is a place for that. The argument for a stitch groove is it sits the stitching beneath the surface of the leather, so therefore the stitching is less likely to wear. It's an Americanism because the style of stitching that the early American leather workers, and we're going back to the early 1900s when Tandy started, the threads were very brutal. The threads weren't necessarily as strong as they could have been, so they were much thicker. So more thread sat on the surface. So they came up with this groove to sink it beneath the surface to hide the vast majority of that bulk. Today, we don't have to use threads like that. We have some awesome, awesome threads. And it's about choosing the right thread for the right SPI for the irons that you're using to get a suitable stitch. Now, when we cut a piece of leather, we have to dress the leather. We also crease the leather. How many times have you seen a piece of leather that's been subject to moisture and we have blisters appear on the surface of the leather? where the fibres beneath the grain has, have swelled and the surface has distorted and we get these water blisters going on. Well, we crease the edge of the leather to protect the leather from water transference under the surface from our edge. We also dress the edge to prevent that water getting in there as well. So it's all about protecting the leather. As soon as you put a stitch groove down there, you have to dress it. If you don't, then moisture will seep in, it will get under the surface, and that's where your blistering will begin to appear. So if you're going to do it, you're going to have to protect the leather, so you've got to dress it. It's a whole process you don't need to get into. In addition to that, if you create a channel that straightens your stitch up and you have a straight line, so all the hard work that you're going to and all the expense um, that you're going to buying a decent set of irons you might as well just use the brutal ones and end up with a straight stitch the other side if we were to cut this piece of leather split it down one and a half mil one side one and a half mil the other side on one side it's the grain side on the other side it's the flesh side and we test the tensile strength of both of those pieces of leather the grain side will be twice as strong as the flesh side. That's not a scientific number, okay? There, there will be a ratio, but the grain side will be stronger. That's the strongest part of the leather. That's the bit that we can take down really thin and still keep our strength. The flesh side is where our suede comes from. The deeper you go down, the fluffier it gets, and the more stretchy it becomes. So the minute you take off uh, the grain side from our leather, you're reducing its strength, you're exposing it to the elements, and you're flattening your stitch. My argument is, well, I want my stitching to sit beneath the surface. Well, if you're using the right iron, the right thread, and the correct tension, it does. It pulls in. So that is telling you that you do not need to use a stitch groove if you stitch correctly. It's a process a technique that is actually working against you. So that's the nice way of putting it. Don't do it, it's horrible. Let's swap out our brutal tool for something with a little more finesse. And perhaps let's actually change the leather colour as well. Now I did a demonstration where I taught a bunch of people stitching and I put my logo on it. That's why it's on there, so it's an over um shoot from that so i'm going to use a different color leather hopefully we can see the holes a little clearer and it'll be a little brighter we are going to stick with a four mil stitch line 
we are going to stick with 7 SPI, 3.85 mil. We are going to make our holes in a very similar fashion. We are going to create a stitch line for our iron to sit over. Now, a lot of people, when they do this, will take the iron and they will sit the iron on top of the line because it's easier to line up. The difficulty with doing that is when you're working a piece of leather, you need to mark it as little as possible. So if we do a lovely stitch line and then proceed to put our irons next to it, when we stitch, we can still see that line. And that looks horrible. We're doing the line so we can hide it. So we are going to straddle the line. So if we imagine this is our tooth, this is our stitch line. We are going to put our tooth onto the line. So half the tooth sits one side and half the tooth sits other. Like that if it were flat, but it's at an angle. So that, when stitched, will hide the line we just created on the leather. This is also why we don't start at one end and come off the other, because we won't stitch all the way to the edge of the leather. We will in some cases, but certainly not here. So we will start short and we will stop short. And that line will be hidden beneath our stitching. So when we look at it, all we see is stitching. We're going to start marking our leather. What I'm going to do is hook the first tooth over the end of the leather. This sets the first stitch in from the edge of the leather. That doesn't necessarily need to be done here, but it's good practice and good habit. Now what I'm going to do is just give it a kiss. Very little else and I can see there that I have made a set of marks so having made the first set of marks I'm happy with the placement the reason we're going for that gentle kiss to start with is if I have drifted off the line I have the ability to pull it back because by the time I drive this iron right through the leather if we have a little bit of a rogue mark we can pull it out once you get good at this, you can perhaps ditch this pricking aspect. I'm going to come as close to the end as we can without having a ridiculously close hole to the edge of the leather. We have a look at our stitch line. Are we happy with what we produce there? And yes, we are. It's nice and straight. It's nice and consistent. So now we can come back and again here we don't necessarily need to overlap our iron because our holes are marked. Now these teeth as we look at them are tapered. However good they are they are still tapered. So if I make a set of holes and we just barely punch through the leather and we go oh, I'm happy with that then we go on to our next set of holes and I really go through the leather again we never take the iron out of the leather we pull the leather off the iron so we can see here that these holes are much larger than these holes that means there's more leather between the holes, so therefore the stitch will be longer. Here, there's less leather between the holes, the stitches will be shorter. We are introducing inconsistencies. Because the tool is tapered, we have to govern the depth. So we have to govern the depth the same every time. We are looking for an amount of steel poking out the back of our leather. And here I have about three millimeters of steel. If I do this the same every single time, then the holes end up being the same size 
every single time. In turn, the length of each stitch will be the same. We have introduced consistency. Let's do our final one. Have a look at the back. Here we can see I've probably only got about two millimeters of steel. So I will pop it back onto the pad. The first strike will seat the iron into the pad. The second strike will drive the iron through the lever. I know which point we can have a look. And now all of a sudden, there's our three mil. So it's about checking. As you become familiar with this technique, you will get used to checking and you will know how hard, how many times you have to strike and you will get all of your holes looking exactly the same. If your holes look the same, irrelevant of what iron you're making, your stitches will be the same length. Consistency. That's all that's about. Again, I'm not going to worry about any back stitches. I'm pretty much going to do exactly what you've just seen me do with the other iron. But we will see a significant difference in the stitch in using the crimson hide iron. So, right hand needle, next available empty hole. It goes through. We have our two objects sticking out the back. Our left hand needle goes between these two objects. Create that cross, pull through, index finger over the top, pull to orders, puts our thread under tension, making it hard to pierce. Even though we've done that, we are not going to assume we haven't pierced, we are still going to pull the thread on just in case. As you get towards multiple layers, that gets more frequent. We then cast. We cast because we want our stitch going from the bottom of the previous hole to the top of the next. So we need this loop on top. Casting is doing that. We take out our slack, we come in nice and intimate, good grip so we don't slide, because if the thread, especially with the synthetic threads, if that slides through the fingers, it will cut you. We pull until they disappear from view, hold and relax. From the top, right hand needle, next available empty hole, we've got our two objects on the back. Our second needle, goes between these two objects, the jam in our sandwich, we create that cross. We pull through, eight to 10 inches, index finger comes over the top. We pull towards us because we're stitching towards us. If we're stitching away from us, we pull away from us. If we're stitching vertically up, we pull up. If we're stitching vertically down, we pull down. We always pull in line with the direction that we're stitching. Our left hand needle points towards the back of the leather, goes into the empty side of the hole because we pull that thread to one side. We can still see this needle is the jam in our sandwich, is between the two threads. Let go with the index finger of the right hand, pull the thread in line with the needle, not at an angle, because if you try and pull like that and it's pierced, you will damage your thread. Pull it in line, pull to make sure we haven't pierced, and cast. We're taking this loop from the bottom to the top by casting. Let go of the thread, take out all the slack. We can see both stitches come in nice and intimate, pull until they disappear from view, hold it and relax. I and mean, then immediately we see that bounce back. Continue on. Right hand needle, next available empty hole. Let go with the index finger and thumb. Left hand needle goes in the gap, creates that cross. Pull through, index finger comes over, pulls towards us because we're stitching towards us. Left hand needle into the empty side of the hole, comes out between the two threads. Let go with the index finger, line the thread up with the needle and pull to make sure we haven't pierced and cast. I'm going to talk about that cast again right now. Come back up, nice and intimate, tension, and we'll see all three stitches move. They seat in, we relax, it bounces back, 
and we have a lovely consistency beginning to appear with our domino style saddle stitch. Now here we can see the angle of the holes a lot clearer. They are pointing from the back of the hole which is high to the bottom of the hole which is at the front. So high to low. We want the stitch to go from low to high. Whatever the hole is doing, the stitch sits opposite. So we pop our right hand needle into the next available empty hole. Create that cross, putting our left hand needle between the two objects on the back. Index finger over the top to pull the thread towards us, tensioning that thread so we don't pierce it and clearing the empty side of the hole that we want to put the needle. Pull the thread to make sure we haven't cast. So again, let's close that loop up so it's dinky. This loop is going to form our next stitch. It wants to go from the bottom of the previous hole to the top of the next hole. This needle is currently high. There is a thread behind it. If I pull that needle out, that thread will sit on top of this thread, pushing it down, flattening that stitch. I want that loop to sit high. Well, we're not going to manipulate that loop because if it's a big loop, gravity will pull it down. We are going to cast by putting that loop up top. It's a very simple way of moving that loop. Take out that needle, take out all the slack. Again, looking for that stitch on both sides, pull until they seat in and relax. And we can see that we are building up consistency in how our stitches look already. Let me do a few more stitches. So here we're seeing this consistency of our saddle stitch beginning to appear. We're not seeing it in its best light. We're going to tap it down and we're going to talk about why we do that. But one thing I want to talk about is, is tension. How many of you are doing this, angling your tension like that? Now that's a good technique, but do you know why? If you don't know why, you don't know where to apply it. Now it is actually a bridle maker's technique to try and make the back look better. But by the very fact that it's a bridle maker's technique, they are stitching with bridle leather. If you do this technique, you're just giving the appearance of, oh, I know what I'm doing. But anybody that does know what they're doing and knows what leather you're using, and if you're using the wrong leather, it doesn't look very clever. And it doesn't look clever because if you are using shoulder, you can mark shoulder really easily. Shoulder is a different cut to bridle. It's tanned differently. So therefore is not as strong. When you tension at an angle with shoulder, what you run the risk of is elongating this hole down on the front and back on the back. And that can cause your stitches to look longer. So if I tension that correctly, but do it at an angle, and I do that for the next few, if I ride my thread at an angle and there's lots of thread, I find that what I can do is actually saw into the leather or burn it, creating a mark. When the stitching's finished, that mark will be visible. So here, with the tension, we can immediately see that these couple of stitches here are beginning to look smaller than these stitches here. They're beginning to look smaller because you're making your hole bigger. You're elongating your hole and you're elongating your hole potentially the wrong way. And if you do it the wrong way, then your stitch will look flat. If you do it the correct way, your stitch will look short. And it's not doing you any favours. With bridle, if you do that, the leather will actually be able to take that level of force. Shoulder, it will not. Side, certainly won't. So to reiterate, 
do another stitch. If you do that, you're sawing at the leather, and then as you tension, you're elongating the hole, damaging the leather. There is absolutely no reason for you doing that, unless you're a bridle maker and you're using bridle leather. If you are going to tension, tension in a sympathetic way for the leather, laterally. Come out. Let me do one more stitch, and then we'll have another look at the front, and we'll see that those three, four stitches that I've just done will look shorter. That's the impact that technique has on your stitching. We can see these look the same as these. It's about consistency. We're changing the dynamics of the hull. If we've gone to the expense of buying the right tool for the job, let the tool do the job. Don't go changing it if you don't know why. If you think it looks clever, it isn't. It's context. You have people that will go, oh, I've seen so-and-so do this. What they're doing is absolutely right. But they're in context. And you get somebody that has seen this and go, well, I'll teach somebody how to do that. So they're doing it because they think, well, I look like a bridal maker now. And they're doing it on shoulder. And you look like you don't know what you're doing. So don't do that because you're damaging your lover. The short version of that is if you're doing that and you're achieving and you're consistent, fine. But you're not doing anything to improve your stitch at all. But if you are consistently achieving, then the question has to be, why change it? We've got to the edge of our clam. An interesting thing begins to happen here. Now I've moved the leather to the other side. As we stitch outside of the clam, the leather moves. This is exactly the same as having the leather too high in the clam. The leather moves. Now, we're not using an awl. If we were to use an awl, this would be a huge issue. But even though we're not using an awl, we are using a needle. And what can happen is, as we put the needle in, the leather's moving. Which means, as the leather moves, we put the needle in to the leather. This is our three millimetre hole here. As we put the needle in, the leather moves, the needle catches the inside of the leather. And it causes all the fibres to be pushed out of the hole. Now the fibres are already being pushed out of the hole, on the back but if we push the fibers out the hole on the front that spoils our stitch line so let me actually try and catch a bunch there we go so here we can see that we've caught loads and loads of fibers there because our leather isn't supported we always try and stitch within the confines of the clam and always try and have the leather as close to the top of the clam as we can whilst comfortably being able to stitch. Now, if we get to that point, our casting can help us because we have this little loop here on the front. What we can do is lift that loop up and you're not going to be able to see clearly what I'm doing because I'm going to put my finger over it. But I'm lifting the loop up high and pressing my finger up against the damaged leather. That causes the thread to come down around the damage and pull it back in. So when I take that finger away, all that leather has been pulled back into the hole. So that's a quick fix if we have caught the edge of the hole with our needle and exploded the fibres out. So this is the result of our stitching. Here in this first section, we can see that we have a reasonable level of consistency. Then when we messed about with the angle tension, we can see that that consistency has changed, but it's changed from here to here. If every one of your stitches look like that, you are still achieving consistently. The argument would be, are you doing anything wrong? Not necessarily. 
are you doing anything positively no you're not and a weaker leather will give more so you are decreasing the size of the leather between the hole so therefore technically decreasing the strength because you are elongating the hole using that technique so it's something that i would recommend not doing stick with your lateral tension but this is the direct result of our stitching we haven't tapped down so we are going to tap down why are we going to tap down it does a number of things for us as we pull the needle out of the hole we have the thread behind it so we've got quite a bit of bulk behind that needle at the eye that can distort the surface of the leather bearing in mind we have a bit of a rub down before we started stitching we've lost that consistency so tapping down puts the leather back in place then we have our holes now because we're undertaking leather work not saddlery we have a much larger hole but even so the size of the hole we've cut is the size of the tip of the tooth the hole that we've ended up with is as a result of driving the tooth into the hole and stretching it because the edges of these teeth are not sharp we haven't cut a big hole we've actually cut a slit and then we force the iron through making a big hole so if we tap down that closes up in closing it up it protects that raw leather from the elements so a very simple way of doing that is we can get an anvil pop our leather onto the anvil and we use a dome headed hammer this is a curved headed hammer so as we strike down it doesn't mark the leather and we tap down a number of things happen one we flatten the leather two if we have any inconsistencies in our tension this assists with that it balances it out and two because we are stitching with a braided polyester we have lost the vibrancy of our thread in tapping down it solidifies it and brings the color back And there we get a far better representation of our stitch. And then with a final rub with a cloth, we can get rid of any excess beeswax that might be sitting on the surface. And there we have a far better representation of our stitch having tapped down. We can now reintroduce our other piece and we can see we also, I mean, we've messed with this because there's bits and pieces where um, we change the stitching style. It's not consistent throughout either run. But we can see that there's quite a distinct difference between those two irons. The bottom one being quite a brutal iron, the top one possessing somewhat more finesse. But we can achieve a credible stitch with both. But certainly, when we look at this one, we are getting something far closer to what we want to achieve with our stitch. That lovely angled saddle stitch, our domino sort of stitch, if you like. So that's an introduction to the stitch. There's more to come. Don't, don't switch off now thinking, that's it, I've got it. Because what we haven't talked about yet is the application of this stitch. And we're going to look at the nuances of how we apply this stitch to our item. And what's more importantly at a later stage is how we change how we stitch given complex situations. So it's more of the same. Hole marking, hole making and stitching. But now we're going to do it as if we are applying it to an item and without actually making an item what we're going to do is take these two pieces of leather mark them up to stitch them together the size and the shape of the leather at the moment doesn't matter because we change the shape if we are consistent with our shapes the process is exactly the same so let's run over it again i'm, I'm not going to apologize for 
teaching you how to suck eggs. I would rather go over it, go over it, go over it, so the information seated in, then assume you've got it, miss something out, and we create a problem because we've forgotten something. So let's have a look at marking and making our holes. Here are my two pieces of leather that we are going to stitch together. Both of these are three millimeters thick, still using case shoulder. Sticking with four mil stitch line. I'm gonna be stitching these two together like this. So how I make my holes is quite important. First and foremost, let's run a line down. Again, start short, stop short. Turn that around because these are the two edges that I want to stitch together, like so. Now, I take my iron and I start by hooking that first tooth over the end of the leather. That sets the first hole one full stitch in from the end of the leather. Now, if I do this exactly the same way on this piece like this, the problem that I encounter is I've started here and started here. But when I go to stitch them together, this comes round like that. So my start point is here now, and this start point is here. This hole is one full stitch from the end. It's set. There's a nice governance, as is this. But this may not be, and this may not be, which means when we stitch them together, we may offset them unintentionally. So when we mark our first set of holes, we mark them as we're going to stitch them. So if I've marked from this end, I'm marking from this end. So I'll pop that tooth over the end on that piece of leather as well. And I will give that a kiss. Now they are marked both from the same end exactly as they're going to get stitched together. So this hole is opposite this hole. That is a huge step towards increasing our consistency. We quite simply then overlap two holes, work down our line and kiss. And we can do these one at a time or we can do them both at the same time. But because we are marking our leather from the same end, our holes will line up. As we get to the end here, we need one more hole. We don't need to overlap and have the tooth or the iron hanging off the leather. We can overlap more teeth. That's absolutely fine. Here we have a nine tooth iron. We've overlapped eight teeth to give us one more hole. That's giving us consistency. Let me do this other piece. Exactly as we've done before, we'll bring our leather onto our pad, pop our irons over our marks, and we'll drive our iron through. Again, we're looking for consistency. Here, I have about two millimetres. One strike puts it back in the pad. Another strike takes it through. Have a look. And there, we've now got three millimetres. Never pull the iron out of the leather. Push the leather off the iron. And it comes out an absolute dream. That gives us a very nice and consistent set of holes. We don't need to overlap because we've already made our marks. At which point then we continue. Have a look, three mil all the way. If we drive the iron through three millimeters every time, all of our holes end up being the same size. If our holes are the same size, our stitches are the same size. Let me make all the holes in both pieces of leather.
all of our holes have been made. Again, even using a high quality iron, we are still distorting the leather by driving the tooth in and stretching the hole. So before we stitch, grab a cloth and then just lightly level the leather off and flattening it down. Not hard, if we do it too hard, we'll close our hole up. Stitching will become difficult. The temptation would be perhaps to go along and tap it down with the hammer. Again, closing our holes up, that's gonna make stitching difficult. But we can see here, because of how we've set our holes, there's a hole opposite on the opposite piece of leather. So when we put these two together, like so, we take a needle now and just randomly put it through a hole, line up the beginning. And we'll pop a needle through, it finds the hole. So that's gonna happen for every single hole. We will start off by taking a needle and putting it through the first hole on our piece of leather, on both pieces. And then we'll take a needle and we'll put it through the last hole on both pieces of leather. If we can find it from the back. Let's do that from the other side. And there we go. What we're looking for when we do this is our two needles are parallel. If they're like this or like that, the leather is misaligned. These are parallel. We are also looking at a nice level at the top of our leather. There is no one piece sticking above the other. This means when it's stitched, this is going to need far less work. This is all down to your placement of your line. Then it's down to the placement of your holes. We get these two right. So first a good cut, then a good line, then good holes. We will have good stitching. It cascades through. What we do here affects this, affects this. We're about to set this in our clam and we're about to stitch it, but we don't yet know how much thread we need. What we're going to do first and foremost is measure the length of our stitching. So we'll just stick a rule up against it. It's easy because it's linear. And here we have uh, 192 millimeters. We are stitching two three millimeter pieces of leather together. So we're stitching a total of six millimeters. How much thread do we need? How many times do we hear the argument times four? That's a guess. You are playing thread chicken. So let's just grab a calculator. Let's put in 192 times four. That gives us 768. Is that the right figure? We don't actually know. But if you go onto my website, armatistleather.com, you will find a downloadable sheet. This tells you how to calculate your thread length. It is now a web app. So it's also something that you can do on the website. In addition to this, it is also a phone app. If you are on Apple, Go to the Apple Store, download the thread length calculator. If you are on Android, go to the Play Store, download thread length calculator. Open it up and this is what it gives you. We are calculating by length. So go to the menu, calculate by length. Here we can have our total length of stitching, which is 192 millimeters. The eyes that we're using are 7 SPI or 3.85 mil. That's already populated because it's the one that I would like you to favor if you're cutting your teeth. But if you're using a different iron, change it. We're gonna leave it on seven because we're stitching seven. The next is the thickness of what we're stitching. We know this leather 
is 3 mil. There's two of them. So our total thickness is 6 mil. We then have length of finishing thread. This is how much thread we need left over to be able to complete our last stitch or back stitches. That's already populated at 200. You can adjust that if you want to, but 200 is enough. And then we simply calculate based on length. Immediately, we see that's come up with 1,384. That's considerably different to 768. If you went times four, it would not complete that stitching. You are playing thread chicken. That's a guess. This is not. This is proven, it's tried, it's tested. But more importantly, it's free. Download it. It's always with you. It's on your phone. Your phone's always with you. And you can always calculate your thread length accurately every single time. If you look at the bottom, it will even give you the hole count, 50. So if we count those, we'll have 50 holes. So having calculated how much thread we want, we've got our thread length and we are happy. We're going to set our leather into our clam. We're going to have our holes as close to the top of the clam as we can have them and still be able to stitch comfortably so it doesn't wobble. We are also going to stitch within the confines of the clam so we have no wobble at either end. And we're going to begin our stitch. Now, we're doing this a little bit differently. I'm going to start off by showing you back stitches. We're going to do a standard stitch and look at the application of that stitch against a simple seam. Because to all intents and purposes, this is a simple seam. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a Sharpie and on top of the leather, I'm going to mark every inch or so. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to stitch an inch and then I'm going to change it. And this is going to help to represent stitching an awkward item. So this may be that we get to the end of a simple seam, but now we've got to stitch vertically. And the item's too big to move in the clam, so we have to adjust how we're stitching. Or, indeed, if we are stitching a belt. It's four foot long. We don't want to stitch it in one full circumference. We want to stitch it in two parts. We stitch one half right-handed, one half left-handed. And it's about looking for and where to apply this cast correctly. That's what we're going to be covering. And when we see how many different times we adjust our stitching, we're looking for, does it change our stitching? And the idea is it shouldn't. So let's have a look. So here on the top, you can see the marks that I've made. And that's the mark where I'm going to change my style of stitching. Now, my clam has my leather. I can take those needles out. I have these needles ready with my thread attached with my 1400. I'll round it up a little bit. First and foremost, back stitches. Do you need to start with a back stitch? Truth is, no, you don't. Because we're starting at the middle of the thread which is strong, that cannot unravel. So you don't technically need to start with a back stitch. But if you're ending with a back stitch on a row of stitching and you finish with a back stitch, we've created an imbalance. It's purely a visual thing and it's an absolute choice. You do not need to do this. But I like the symmetry that if we have finished with a back stitch and we have started with a back stitch, there is a symmetry there. And that balances an item, especially if we're looking at the top of a pouch of a bag and we've got a back stitch at the beginning at the top and a back stitch at the end at the top, it balances. So if I start with a back stitch, that's why. So let's have a look at how we do that. Because we're using a synthetic thread, we can apply heat to it. And that means we need to apply less back stitches. If we're using linen, perhaps we would apply more. I'm going to apply two back stitches, so therefore I'm going to start third hole from the end. 
Now, these two pieces of leather have been independently marked. These two pieces of leather, and we'll talk about what's happening with the holes shortly, have been independently marked and they may close up. We may have a little bit of a struggle pulling our needle through. A really good tip, rather than using pliers, is having a bit of beeswax. We can grip our needle with the beeswax, very much like pliers, or we can rub our needle with beeswax, and that gives us a good grip to pull through. So the first thing that I'm going to do now is put the two needles together and centre my thread. And there we are. So to all intents and purposes now, I have one thread on the front with a needle, one thread on the back with a needle. I'm ready to start. So our stitching style that we've already examined doesn't change. There are variations because of change in direction, but to all intents and purposes, it is the same stitch. Right hand needle, next available empty hole. We are stitching away from us. So it's the next hole away from us. And we pop that into that hole like so. On the back of our leather, we can see our two objects, our thread and our needle. Our left hand needle always goes between those two objects, the jam in our sandwich. We pick up that needle and we pull through eight to 10 inches or so. Our index finger then comes over, hooks that thread. It pulls away from us because we are stitching away from us. This puts the thread under tension in the hole, making it harder to pierce, but not impossible. And it also clears the side of the hole where we want to put our second needle. And then we can pop that back in there nice and deeply. Now we hope we haven't pierced our thread, but we're going through now six millimeters of leather. The likelihood of piercing the thread is far greater. So we are going to pull that thread in line with the needle. And here we can see we have pierced it. You don't need to take the needle out. All you need to do is continue pulling that thread and it will come off the needle. It's as simple as that. So as long as you pull that thread, you will avoid any piercing. Here, the question arises, do we need to cast? And we can see because of the irons that we've used, the holes are much, much clearer. We can see now because we're stitching away from us, we're going from the top of this hole to the bottom of this hole. So if we're going from top to bottom, the loop wants to be at the bottom. It already is. So we do not need to cast. So we'll just grab the needle and we'll take out all of the slack. Now, looking at it from the top, we can still see our two stitches. We come in nice and intimate. Now, this is going to change from our single piece of leather for our power. Let's say, for instance, we wanted 20 pound of power for our single piece. We will probably need 14 pound of power for two pieces because the two pieces together are more spongy. That only changes when we glue them together. So we pull that until they disappear from view, hold it for a moment and relax. That seats our first stitch into place nicely. We continue, right hand needle, next available empty hole, and I'm stitching right handed, right hand priority, simple seam. Push it into the hole nice and deep. We have our two objects sticking out the back of the leather. Our left hand needle, goes between those two objects, creates that cross, grips that cross, pulls the needle with the thread behind it, eight to 10 inches. Index finger comes over the top, hooks that thread, pulls away from us because we're stitching away from us. We now turn the left hand needle back towards our hole on the back of the leather, and that now pops through between the two threads. It's still the jam in our sandwich. It's still between the two. Having done that, we now pull that thread in line with the needle to make sure we haven't pierced it. We haven't. We know we don't need to cast. We can let go of that thread. Pick the needle up, pull it through, 
take out all of the slack. Do not tension with a full length of thread. There's a bounce to it and your tension will be inconsistent. Keeping the tension from the front, or so, sorry, from the side, we're going to hold our threads nice and tight and we're going to pull until they disappear from view and we can see that settles in. What's happening there is we're applying a nice amount of force to this stitch, but in addition, we're also applying force to this stitch and that helps to see that in. Hold it for a moment and let go. We're at the end. We now need to change direction. We are going to stitch back towards us. Right hand, right hand priority. So our right hand needle goes into the next hole towards us. This is going to be fun because there's already two threads inside this hole. I'm stitching with Amy Rourke. This is a round thread, but nonetheless, this is still 0.55. So I'm still looking at best part of two millimeters of bulk going through that hole with a millimeter of thread, 1.1 millimeter of thread sitting in the hole. It's all getting tight. If we're gonna need our beeswax, it's gonna be now. So we can come in, grip our needle with our beeswax and pull through. Much better than pliers. Go back and create our cross. Now we have our two objects on the back, still between the two objects. Even though we pulled through, we could always pull that back a little bit. There we are, so that's really close. So we don't get confused. In the middle, between our two objects, the jam in our sandwich, we create our cross and we pull through eight to 10 inches or so. Index finger comes over the top. Now, because we're stitching towards us, we pull towards us. Our left hand needle now points towards the back of the leather and goes in behind that thread because there is no empty side of the hole. And we push that in nice and deeply. We let go with the index finger and thumb of the right hand. We line the thread up with our needle and we pull to make sure we haven't pierced. Do we need to cast? We need to check again because we change direction. Again, we are looking at what's happening to our stitch. And our stitch is asking to go from the bottom of the previous hole to the top of the next hole. That means this loop has to be on top. So we either lift the loop up like so, which isn't going to work, or we just simply cast, which puts the loop high. We push that in. Again, we're going to need our beeswax because now there's three threads in that hole as well as the needle we're trying to stitch, grip, and pull. Get rid of the beeswax and take out most of the slack, not all. You want to leave two little loops big enough to get a pencil through because we need to govern how our stitches are going to sit at our back stitches. What we don't want are our stitches crossing like this. That'll look horrible. And it's all about the hole the thread is coming out of. So this is the loop that we're working and this is the hole it's coming out of. And we're looking to see if this thread coming out of that hole is sitting high or low of the existing stitch. And we can see quite clearly there that if we pull it in line, it's sitting high. It wants to go above the existing stitch. So we push that loop up, get it out of the way, get our needle and put it under the loop on top of the existing stitch. Then we pull the left hand thread. We will see the thread hit the needle and then we keep the needle where it is. The needle will cause that loop to rise up, sit high above the existing stitch, at which point then we can take that needle away. Those two stitches are now sitting parallel. We do exactly the same on the back. It's about this hole here. Now here, if we line it up, we can see that actually wants to sit low. So we push that loop down. We put our needle under the existing stitch to keep it low. We pull the right hand thread. The needle hits, or the thread hits the needle. The needle causes it to sit parallel. 
and then when it's seated we can see they sit side by side and at which point then we come in nice and close and we tension and we hold that's our first full back stitch taken care of we do the same for the next one right hand needle next hole this is going to be easier because there's only one thread in that hole push the needle in nice and deep we have our two objects sticking out the back our left hand needle goes between those two objects creates that cross we then pull through eight to ten inches or so index finger comes over the top pulls towards us because we're stitching towards us left hand needle points towards the back of the leather and goes in behind that thread let go with the index finger and thumb line the thread up with the needle pull to make sure we haven't pierced we've already checked that we need the loop high because it's going from bottom to top so the loop needs to be on top so therefore we cast a little bit of beeswax on that needle just to give some grip and we can pull that out take out most of the slack not all leaving two loops big enough to get a pencil through what happened before is likely to happen again and we can already see this is the hole that we're looking at it's coming out high so we push that loop up put the needle under the loop put the needle on top of the existing stitch and pull the left hand thread it hits the needle rides up the needle and sits parallel to our existing stitch on the back what happened before will happen again and we can already see that's wanting to sit low so we push the loop down put the needle under the existing stitch pull the right hand thread that causes that stitch to sit parallel with the first and we'll stay where we are for tension and that's our two back stitches taken care of